It's the show that Quentin Tarantino is going to make his 11th film about. It is the Mike Sasson Show, broadcasting on the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com, where you get the best music, you get the best talk. My name's Mike. This is my show. It's the Mike Sasson Show. Uh, with me, as always, is the greatest producer in the history of internet radio. It is, of course, Alex Clemens. Alex, how are you doing today? I'm doing just wonderfully. How are you, Mike? I'm doing fine. Today's show is jam-packed with all sorts of internet radio goodness. Uh, we're going to be reviewing the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the new Quentin Tarantino movie. I saw it this past weekend. I will give you my thoughts. Also, I'm going to be giving you my thoughts on the Billy Graham rule and how it might be uh, not the worst thing you could possibly think of doing in the year 2019. Also, we're going to be talking about the great debate about boneless wings versus regular chicken wings plus uh woodstock 99 it uh just celebrated its 20th anniversary i attended woodstock's uh 99 and a recent article uh depicted it in a very negative light we'll talk about that plus a bishop in cyprus has figured out according to him the origins of gay people so uh yeah you already know that's probably going to be a little kooky. Again, my name's Mike Sasson. Um, you can listen to the Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com, or you can listen to it on the TuneIn Radio app across the planet Earth, or you can listen to classic Mike Sasson shows from the last three years on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Now, Alex, um, are you a Quentin Tarantino fan? Um, not really. Um, I, not that I'm not a fan. I just really haven't seen that many of his movies. What movies have you seen? Uh. Did you see Pulp Fiction? No. Did you see Inglorious Bastards? Yes. Did you see Jackie Brown? No. Did you see Reservoir Dogs? Nope. Did you see Kill Bill? Nope. See, barely any. Okay, so I think right now we're at one. Yeah. Okay. That seems probably what did you think right. of Inglo What did you think of Inglorious Bastards? To be honest, I really don't remember it, but I feel like it wasn't my type of movie. Okay, so this past weekend then, uh, a movie that you had no interest in seeing came out, which was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, it was the ninth film by Quentin Tarantino, and the reason why that's important is he claims that he's only going to make ten movies. So he's kind of making the point that, hey, I'm getting to the end of the line here. Now, he'll probably find a way to, like, kind of finagle him. Like, it's like when the Rolling Stones back in the 70s and the 80s were like, oh, this is our farewell tour. And then they just came back anyway. If the money's right, he'll show up. Um, but uh, this past weekend, I did see the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And uh, now you're, you're sitting there, and if you're a fan of the Mike Sasson show, you sit there and say, Mike, if you've seen the film, tell us what you think couple things. First and foremost, Alex, like any movie, especially a Quentin Tarantino movie, um, the buzz around it starts like two years into the future. You know, yeah. it, it, it's like people hear about it. And this one, it was one of those movies that people, when they, when they heard the premise, were just like, oh my God, this could be really something juicy for Quentin Tarantino to get his uh, his arms around because, or his teeth into, or whatever you'd want a person to do something interesting about. Um, because the initial like publicity was, Quentin Tarantino is going to do a movie about the Manson killings. Yeah. Now, if you don't know anything about it, Charles Manson, back in 1969, on two separate days, led a group of dirty hippies in the murder of Hollywood starlet Sharon Tate, uh, a bunch of other uh, fa uh, decently famous people, along with someone who was uh, an heiress to the Folgers Coffee fortune, as a po and also the person who was like a big-time like supermarket uh, heiress as well. And so everyone was scared because rich people... People in Hollywood were getting murdered by dirty hippies, and so it created this this phenomenon. And to still to this day, if you ever bring up like crazy people and 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 serial killers, one of the first names that pops up is Charles Manson. He's like almost synonymous with crazy psychos. Correct, Alex? Correct, definitely. So. 
when it was discussed that Quentin Tarantino was going to do a movie about the Manson killings, especially since Quentin Tarantino is known for having gruesome violence in his movie. People were like, oh, dear God, what is he going to do? Is he going to recreate the murders? Is he going to is it going to be just a slaughter fest? What the heck is this going to happen? And then word came down that he was getting Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt to be in this movie. So <clears throat> he was getting two big time A level Hollywood super dudes to be in a single movie. Then the decision came down that Margot Robbie, who is one of the most beautiful women working today, was going to be playing Sharon Tate. The buzz became incredible that this was going to be just a, 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 a big time Hollywood super movie. A um, couple things after seeing it. Little aside, uh, my brother actually, uh, who's out here in Hollywood, John, was an extra Ooh. on this movie. What did what was he? What did he do? Like, what scene was he in? He was uh, he he went to the Playboy Mansion actually <gasps> for two straight nights, and he was playing like in the movie the the Sharon Tate and. Um, Roman Polanski, who were married at the time in 1969, go off to the Playboy Mansion, and my brother John plays one of the people at the party. Like, he's just an extra in the background as they're all singing and dancing and, and being 1969 and all that kind of Damn, stuff. Damn, where did I miss the sign-up for that? Well, he said that he was in, like, 70s garb, and then all the rest of the women were in, like, bikinis, but, like, 1969 bikinis, and also, or they were dressed up as, like, Playboy bunnies and all this other kind of stuff, and he actually got to uh, be pretty close to Margot Robbie, and here was his description. He said Margot Robbie was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life to the point to where he didn't think he she was real. Wow. 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 Um, and he also got to uh, hear Quentin Tarantino's direction to Margot Robbie. Like, that's how close uh, he uh, he was to the two as they were going around. So that's a little, that's cool. Uh, now, my brother John uh, saw the movie this past weekend. I guess we're going to probably have to wait till the DVD to, like, slow it down to see if the, he was in it or if there was, like, a thing where you could see the face and all that other kind of stuff. But yeah. kind of a cool thing that my brother John was uh, a part of this movie. Hell yeah. Um, but to surmise it, and I don't want to give away the ending because the ending is one of the most original that uh, has been part of a big-time Hollywood movie in a long while. But just to give this synopsis, the movie is not about necessarily the Manson killings, in my opinion. Right. The movie is about Hollywood and the Hollywood hierarchy and people's want and desire to move up in that hierarchy. Yeah. Especially now being here, really your life can be consumed by the want and pursuit of of getting into whatever club there is. Like in the movie, essentially, um, Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski play a couple that at the time in 1969 were at the top of the Hollywood pyramid. The, you know, Roman Polanski had just written and directed the super hit Rosemary's Baby, and Sharon Tate was, was starting to be in movies and married to Roman Polanski, and so they were kind of Hollywood's it couple. And then the step down, you get Leonardo DiCaprio, who is playing like an aging western tv star and people were starting to call him kind of like a, a has-been so he was doing well because he owned a house in the hollywood hills that had a pool it was nice he had drove a nice car but he wasn't in that roman polanski level sharon tate level so there was that wanting and longing to be into that level yeah then you had the Brad Pitt level, which was a step below that, and Brad Pitt played his uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's driver and stuntman and stuff like that. And one of the weird things, especially now watching this movie as a person that lives in Southern California, you get to the different like hierarchies and level. Like for instance, obviously, like Leo lives in the Hollywood Hills, whereas Brad Pitt's character lives in Van Nuys. 
which is like if, you know, someone in Pittsburgh lived in Sewickley and then their maid lived in McKee's Rocks. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it definitely was like a hierarchy type deal. Then you had the Manson family, and they were kind of just like the outlying hippies and kind of signifying the change and the youth, but the sort of the promise of the youth, but also the danger of the youth. And so it was interesting all about that. Um, so not to give anything away, it was extremely interesting to watch the movie from a perspective of someone who is now starting to enter into this world and somewhat, and how much people's lives are, especially in comedy, like you want to be at the comedy store, you want to be, you know, working at the Laugh Factory, you want to be a paid regular at the, la you know, at the, at the comedy store, and then once you're in, then you want to get the biggest agent and the biggest this, and so you can get wrapped up in that kind of world and everything like that. Um, the other thing that I would say about this movie is Brad Pitt, Leo DiCaprio, and Margot Robbie again show why they're big time movie superstars. Like they they are mesmerizing on the screen, especially Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt played a hardcore bad dude in this movie. Like he kicks ass in this movie, and. Like, I lament the fact that there's no more, like, uh, trained ass beaters. Brad Pitt plays a trained ass beater in this movie. Oh, yeah. Um, so that was pretty cool. Plus, for the ladies out there and for certain men, uh, he takes his shirt off, like, on a roof while he's fixing a TV antenna. And for 50-something years old or whatever he is the guy is in insane shape. Like, you just sit there and you're like, this guy literally his life to look that good on camera. I uh, I think that that I you definitely sold me on the movie thus far. I think and that really pushed it over the edge. That little tip. The fact that you see you you, you see a a, sh a a prominent shirtless level um, Br Brad Pitt. Yes. Now I would sit there and say the movie does eventually get to some very gruesome violence. Oh. Are you against gruesome violence? I guess it depends on what kind of gruesome violence, you know? Explain further. I don't know. I, 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 um, I think there are certain things where it seems like unnecessary shown gruesome violence as opposed to it has a point. You know what I mean? Um, I would say the gruesome violence you see in this movie, especially if you know about the Manson killings, I would put them under the justified gruesome violence. Yeah, because I think I, that makes sense to me, and I think that because it like has some kind of like story and you know some kind of truth behind it as well, I think that would be okay with me. I don't like. I'm not a big fan of like scary movies that just like you know shoot people's brains out just because for no reason. That doesn't really drive the plot forward or give you any kind of you know meaning or anything like that. Now, I will say that there's a large section of this movie in the middle to where you will be openly asking yourself, what the hell is going on? Yeah, like, I it heard definitely, that, yeah. It, It's definitely a movie where Quentin Tarantino had no supervision. Like, he could have made a six-hour movie if he wanted to. Yeah. And there are certain scenes where you're like, you know what, I get your point. I don't know why you're doing it this long. But at the ending of the movie made, in, at least in my mind, the movie satisfying. So I wouldn't say it's his best movie, but I definitely would say it was an extremely satisfying movie. Well, I heard that it was very, like, very much so character-driven as opposed to plot-driven, which I think uh, is sometimes boring to people um, because it's just you're trying to build up those characters so much, and like you said, you get to a point where it's just like, okay, like, I get it. Like, I get who this person is. Like, let's just kind of move forward, you know? Well, it's funny because, like, I think of the three characters you talk about character development – Leo's character was very well developed and you get some very emotional scenes with him. Mm -hmm. Brad Pitt's character, all you learn about him is that he's kind of a shady dude, but he's a total badass. Yeah. Um, Sharon Tate in this movie, Margot Robbie, essentially all you know about her is she is insanely gorgeous <laughs> and she's a happy person. 
Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I guess what, I feel like ahead. Leo's the biggest character in the in the film, right? So that makes sense. Well, I mean, Brad Pitt and Leo are kind of the 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 two. You know, they're the leading men. But it's interesting how. If you sit there and say that he made the kind of a, a, a fantasy western type movie, definitely Brad Pitt would have been kind of like the like the the Clint Eastwood type character in the movie. Yeah. Also, I think he was making kind of a a, a judgment about Hollywood because in the movie, Leo was the guy on the movie screen and on the TV screen that played the badass. But in reality, Brad Pitt was a badass. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he was trying to make it to where, like, the the actors are kind of wimpy, but there are some real hardcore dudes that make Hollywood go. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of people that were very upset saying that the movie did not did not serve women well. And that especially the Margot Robbie character, you know, the Margot Robbie, uh, uh, Sharon Tate character, she really, other than just looking angelic and all, and just like a perfect human being, didn't do much else than just basically smile and walk around and look like a perfect human being. Yeah. That seems like an ideal uh, role to play in my mind. Like you would, if they, if they hired you, you'd be like, okay, Alex, you don't say much. You just look insanely beautiful, walk around looking insanely beautiful. And all of us watching you just basically just all we need to know about you is that you're happy and that you're insanely beautiful. Yeah, exactly. That's like my life as it is. So, I mean, just put it in a movie, you know? You would sit there and say the way I describe Sharon Tate in this movie, how she's just like everyone around her is just real happy to see her. You feel that that is Alex, the Alex Clemens story? Absolutely. They should have just done that as a movie. I would sit there and say then I'm the Brad Pitt character because I'm like the hardcore badass. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and then we have to find like, what are you saying? I said, yeah. Okay, because I thought you might have been disagreeing with me. You just assumed then, I would disagree with you. You didn't actually listen to what I said. You just assumed that I would be disagreeing. Yeah, I assume most of this show is essentially I saying something about me, and then you'd completely disagree. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably right. Yeah, I've, I've, we've done it for now more than three years. I've gotten the pattern down. Um, now, finally, I would sit there and say, again, the people that are mad at this movie, like in the movie to show how much of a badass Brad Pitt's character is, he kind of beats up Bruce Lee. Oh. Like he shows that he's not afraid of Bruce Lee and then he kind of can mess with him a little. And people who are like fans of Bruce Lee are sitting there going like, well, geez, why are you, why are you picking on Bruce Lee? Why are you making it? And then it's like, well, in the character development to show how much of a badass uh, Brad Pitt is, you kind of have to, you know, show the, the audience like this guy how much of a, you know, kick-ass dude he is. And so with that, you kind of have to show him messing with another bad dude yeah and that was bruce lee it's a good frame of reference absolutely and i also can get if you're a woman and you sit there and say that you know quentin tarantino does not write good roles for women other than jackie brown but like in this movie you could definitely get to the point of like okay why is it that you know we don't learn more about sharon tate why don't we learn more about what her background is who she is all this other kind of stuff but to me the way i think that quentin tarantino was trying to to make a point was all all that Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate were in this movie was essentially the top of the rung. Yeah. And they were the king and the queen, and we were supposed to be looking up to them and not really knowing much about them kind of deal. Right, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. So overall, I would say for Alex, I don't think that this is a movie you'd want to see in the theaters, but I definitely think that if it was like on Netflix or something, you would if you had like two and a half hours to kill on a rainy day, you would you would not mind it. I mean, I kind of want to see it in theaters just so I can see Brad Pitt taking his shirt off on a really big screen. I feel like that won't be as beautiful um, if I see it, you know, watching it on Netflix, even though I do have like a 70 inch TV. I don't think it's the same. I think I need that high quality shirtless Brad Pitt, you know. Is there any way that you could maybe go to the theater and like just say, okay, give me the moment where he takes off his shirt and then you just sit in the movie theater for two minutes and then leave? 
I think I'll sit through it. I mean, I, the movie actually sounds very interesting to me, and from what uh, people have told me about it in like reviews and stuff about it, it actually seems very good. I think I might actually enjoy it. So I kind of want to go see it, uh, aside from the whole uh, Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt deliciousness. So you're just going to sit there and just going to enjoy the absolute just... See, I'd like to have a conversation with you after you saw it. I, me and my sister Mary, my, my sister Mary saw it Saturday early afternoon. I saw it like at midnight, which means I didn't get out until like almost three in the morning on sat on like Sunday morning. That would have been. Um, and we had like an hour and a half conversation about the movie. So that's like how intricate it can be or just how me and my sister can just talk about anything for an hour and a half. <laughs> I think it's probably more so that. Plus, I need to see okay. Leo, too. He's my first crush, you know, and, you know, sadly not my future husband, but that's cool. Who, who Brad Pitt? No, Leo. Leo. Why yeah. can't Leo be, oh, because you're old now. Yeah, because he doesn't want me anymore. There was actually a story, and I, I, I kind of cut it, where his current 22-year-old girlfriend uh, went on Instagram and was uh, rallying uh, or uh, against all the haters that was saying that Leo doesn't love you. Leo's just going to go on and move on to some other woman. And she showed a picture of Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart, who had like a 30-year age difference and all this other kind of stuff. So I don't know. Maybe if the woman is kind of getting a little antsy like that, then uh, there might be an opening for you eventually. Maybe. I mean, I, I like I said, I think one day, you know, maybe in his 60s, that's where he finds me. The love of well, his then life. you would be in your 40s. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I can wait okay, until good. I'm 40 to be with Leo. There you go. I'll wait forever. Um, now, speaking of, of, of women, um, there's a thing coming around with, like, conservative politicians. And um, apparently there is this rule amongst evangelical Christians. It's called the Billy Graham rule. Okay. Now, how, how aware are you of who Billy Graham is? Not at all. Okay. Billy Graham was one of those guys that, like, he would appear on TV, like, at, like, 11 p.m. on a Sunday, and he'd be in a giant stadium talking about Jesus and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And he'd always, like, meet with the president, and he'd, he'd eventually come to Pittsburgh, and he would play Three River Stadium and, every, you know, and all that kind of good stuff. And so he was a very popular, like, evangelical preacher. Okay. And so apparently there's this rule that Billy Graham kind of initiated in like the 1940s, which was a man who is in like, you know, a, an evangelical man should never meet with or have dinner with a woman without his wife present or without other people present. He should never be alone with a woman who is not his wife. What happens before he meets his wife? Or is it just after you're married? I think it's after you're married. Okay. Um, and I also think once you become the preacher, then you might need to have, like, buddies. Essentially, he's just saying, I want witnesses whenever I'm meeting with a woman. Yeah, I mean, I think that's smart. Well, see, that's the point I'm making is a lot of people – are railing against this, like, uh, you know, uh, Vice President Pence said this, say, hey, I don't have dinner with people that are not my wife unless my wife is present, and everyone's like, oh, you know, whatever. And the way I kind of think about it is it's like I don't think that veganism is a bad idea. I don't think that getting nine hours of sleep a night is a bad idea. I don't think that, you know, um, getting, you know, running five miles a day is a bad idea. I don't do it, but I don't think it's a bad idea. This basically saying I don't meet with women or don't ha get, have meetings with women without essentially my wife present or other people present, I would never do it, but I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. I think, yeah, for people, like especially people in power, I think that's a good idea. It's not saying that I feel like people are upset about it because like, well, how am I going to cheat on my wife? But you can still cheat on your wife. You just have to have other people there. You just have to have buddies who are willing to be just like, dude, I don't see shit. Yeah, they're your hype men, you know, and they come around with you everywhere, and they ha they're they there, you know, so they supervise. They know what's going on. They could, you know, be a witness to whatever terrible things that you're doing if you needed them to be or if you needed them not to be. 
Um, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever witnessed a uh, girlfriend who you knew was in a relationship cheating on said boyfriend? Um, no, I don't think so. Really? Never? No one has ever done anything nefarious around you in, w around your presence? No, I think that's usually me. Okay, you've been <laughs> I'm the around. person you've, in that situation. You've cheated on your boyfriend <laughs> is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, were other people present around that knew this? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you specifically make sure that those people are around because you knew that they were your ride or dies and they weren't going to be a, a bunch of squealers? No, I was definitely just very stupid about it and did it in front of people. Not necessarily so, in front of people, but that people knew. So let me ask you a question then. Do you think that there needs to be the Alex Clemens rule, which is if you're going to cheat, uh, make sure that the people around you are super cool people? Yeah, yeah, or just, you know, just uh, make it known regardless, you know? Just tell everyone. Wait, just say, hey, you know, I cheated on Dave with uh, Kyle. Yep, this is what happened. This is me. And then just say to the yeah. other dude, if you don't like it, then guess what? You you don't want to get on this Alex train. Yep, then you can leave. You know what, Alex? I think that's even a better thing, which is essentially you sit there and you tell your wife, like, here's the deal. I don't have dinner with women without you present unless I want to. Yes, exactly. Boom. I think we figured everything out. We did. This was a very productive first uh, segment of the show, Alex. As it always is, Mike. There you go. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to be doing Bar Thoughts and Experiences with Alex. And then later on, we're going to be doing News and Notes. Again, this is the Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com. We'll be right back. We're back with the Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge. Again, at www.riversedgepgh.com, where you get the best local music, you get the best talk. Also, you can listen to us on the TuneIn Radio app across the planet Earth, or you can listen to classic Mike Sasson shows on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Google Play, where, again, you can listen to all of the drunken glory of the greatest Internet radio producer of all time, Alex Clemens, and her award-winning Bar Thoughts and Experiences with Alex. Alex, play the theme song. My style's dope any way that you slice it. Here's a fresh cut, hope that you like it. About to open up a can of some cancer. When it comes to pizza. That was beautiful, Mike. Thank you. You wanna know what one fun part about my life is? I, this is not my bar thought, but um, right. because I change hair color so much, um, mm -hmm. when I wear clothes that I maybe haven't worn in a while, I get to find old colored hairs. And it's always a fun little game of mine of where like I I, you know, I win in my mind um, whenever I find, like, the oldest color hair that I've had. So, like, if I find an orange one, which is, like, a year old, that's, like, a fun little win for me during my day, you know? I hear you. I, I have the same thing with receipts um, and old um, open mic set lists. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, yeah. Memories. Yeah, memories. Memories of, oh, that didn't work. That's basically what the <laughs> memories come back to. Um, like, oh, that was a horrible idea. Why did I ever think that was funny? My new phone, I just realized literally almost like a year into owning it that I have that, like, uh, I have that, uh, like, that pen on it. I can write on it without opening it up, and that becomes my notes. Amazing. I know. It's amazing how the pen that I knew was there could actually be used as a pen. But anyways, Alex, um, bar thoughts and experience with it. Alex, Alex, what is your thought for this week? Um, okay, so I've been doing a lot of drinking by the water. This weekend I went up to um, Conneaut Lake and um, Presque Isle in Erie um, and just drank by the water all weekend, which is a nice little getaway. Um, now, does your, new, does your new gentleman quarter actually have a boat? No, no, no. I have a boat. You just, oh, you have the boat. You're the big time boat person. No, I mean, I have a boat. We don't use it. It's just, but it's there. Um, but no, we, we've rented a boat. Ah, okay. 
because yeah. I've seen you a lot of pictures with you on a boat recently, and I'm just like, where did Alex? I knew Alex had like Mangahela boat, but I didn't know she had like lake boats. Yeah, no, 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 no. Our boat is uh, permanently docked um, in our yard. Ah. Um. Anyways, yeah. So I've been doing a lot of w- water drinking, uh, beach drinking, that kind of goodness. Um. And so I wanted to do a little couple of perks that I found about drinking by the water, which are pretty obvious, but a lot of fun, and it'll make you want to go and do this this summer, because you need to, because summer's ending and it's almost over, and fall's going to be here soon. Um, Unless you live in Southern California, in which basically nothing much will change. Yeah, okay, whatever, Mike. Um, <laughs> but all of us here back in Pennsylvania, where it gets cold, you know, we have to deal with the sad truth that summer is coming to an end. Um, anyways, so some perks about drinking by the water. One, um, it's hot out, so typically you're getting drunk faster because you're dehydrated with dehydration. Um, with the dehydration, I agree. Yeah, um, you get a nice little tan while you're drinking, which I think is being very productive. I think all of drinking by water makes me feel like I'm doing something productive with my day, as opposed to, like, if I had just done, like, a normal Sunday fun day and I was just like in a bunch of bars drinking, that doesn't make Mm -hmm. me feel productive. But the fact that I'm outside, I'm like getting a tan, I'm enjoying the weather, I feel super productive. I do this a lot in the summer even without drinking. Like if I really want to watch TV but it's a beautiful day outside, I will just watch TV outside so that I feel more productive with my day. Do you do that? Uh, no, I don't watch TV outside, um, (laughs) but I will say this, um, there is something intrinsically wonderful about water. Like again in Pittsburgh with the rivers and stuff like that, Lord, like last week I actually had a buddy from Pittsburgh, a a work friend come down and visit because he was doing training in Southern California. So he was in Orange County. So we went to Huntington Beach. Now, even though it was the night and we weren't really necessarily seeing much of anything, it was something very soothing about the ocean Mm. and something whatever. And honestly, I did have a few beers while near the ocean. And it was something to where like it it was it was it, it really is kind of a meditation like you can understand why there's a bunch of like really spiritually aware people that live near the ocean because it really does focus you on like this idea of that like there's not much in, there's, we take really a lot too seriously oh, yeah. and if you can find a way to get like if there's a dream house for mike the dream house for mike is i need something in the mountains I'll have something back in Pittsburgh. I'll have something probably in, like, the hills of Hollywood, but then I want the beach house in, like, the Malibu. So I can just walk out with my cup of coffee and just right there onto the beach at, like, 7 a.m. That's got to be, like, the height of just, like, tranquilness. You know what I'm saying? Agreed. And I think, you know, for me, I think drinking just heightens that, you know, so I'm getting more into that mind space, you know. Also, Mm. another perk about drinking by water is like a lot of um, like um, a lot of activities that have to do with water. I'm not honestly very fond of like I don't like going and playing in waves and I don't really like, you know, just like kind of swimming around playing games in the water. They're like okay and fun, but like drinking makes everything much more fun. The possibility that more of a possibility that you're going to drown, you know, because you're drunk and you have no idea what's going on. That's so much fun, you know, in playing games. You're like just having such a better time than if you weren't playing games. Like I do not like going into the water if there are waves, but if I'm drinking, who cares? Let's do it. Yeah, so essentially you get your nerve up to enjoy the water and then do games that ultimately could result in your death. Yes, exactly. Um, There you go. Also, I think one of the most obvious, um, there's a place for you to pee and, you know, release all that stuff. If poop, I guess if you're a wild one um, and like to poop in water that I don't know. I don't know if people do that. No, I've never experienced. I've had a ton of buddies pee in water uh, in the ocean or rivers i've never had a poop i think poop most people just poop on land yeah i mean i i definitely think if i was if i was you know just really struggling and i really 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 needed to and they're like 
land or like a house was really far away, I think I'd honestly do it. I don't think I'd have uh, too many but thoughts how against would you it. Do, I mean, you would have to almost remove the bikini bottom. Oh, yeah. Com but like in peeing, you just pee through the whatever and like nature washes it. But like for poo, you would have to almost just like be in the lake, take off the thing, hope that the poo doesn't like float up into your, you know, your own thing because it doesn't go <laughs> away or anything like that. There's so many different things about pooing in the water. Yeah, I think you'd have to be in the most perfect position um, and yeah, not worry about getting it over your whole body. I think that would be the only way you could do it. Or maybe you just like, uh, yeah, uh, no, nope, I think that's it. You just have to worry. You have to get in the right position, which is always, you, you know, pooping outside. You always have to be in the exact right position. But pooping in water, I mean, you'd honestly have to be almost like, you'd almost have to be like treading backwards while pooing. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's good. Like on, so that, on like your the back. So would just go and float that way. Yeah. You can't stand still because the poop would just come up here. And unless it's like really solid poop, then all of a sudden you're just in a, in a world of your own humid sewage. Yeah. All right. So maybe just pee um, and get that over with. Um, mm -hmm. lastly, most, most obvious one, fun sex spots, you know, drinking by water, you're already feeling loosey goosey. And then there's fun sex spots for you, um, by the water, you know, on a boat, yeah, by the water, in, the water. in the water, because I've read a lot of issues do not have sexual intercourse in lakes or oceans or even swimming pools, because that's how you get like a little, like, like weird stuff inside of you. Kind that's of deal. for the lamos, Mike. You know, you got to take a chance. You're going to die anyways. Why not have it be from having sex in water? Or don't and live. Ugh. That seems silly. You know, oh. but anyways, in the water, on a boat, on the dock, you know, so many I fun have no places. problem with dock or boat. I have the problem with in the water. I do have a problem with docks sometimes because they're usually wooden. And that can be a little tricky. There's a lot of splinters, you know? I agree that you got to make sure you put maybe some sort of cushion down. Yeah, a cushion f for the pushing. <laughs> yeah, you got to have the cushion for the pushing so that you get the good pushing. Okay. With the cushion. Yep. But yeah, so uh, go drink by the water and don't let summer pass you by before you know it, unless you're Mike and you live in stupid LA and it's nice all the time. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Hey, you're welcome, Mike. Anyways, all right. Now we go on to news and notes from the world of uh, celebrity, food, and weirdness. Play the theme song. Get all stars now. Now, Alex, I don't know if you knew this, but we are recording this on Monday, and today is <laughs> International Chicken Wing Day. I thought you were going to say it. I didn't know it was Monday because I have been struggling, but I did not know it's International Chicken Day. Is that what you said? Chicken Wing Day. Oh, not chicken shit. Day, not, not just general chicken. Chicken wing. Okay. Um, I did not have any chicken wings today. I had some yesterday. Well, well, I think you should have some because, again, celebrate the day. But um, there was a big debate on Twitter of the, 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 the big battle between the boneless wings and the regular bone-in wings. Oof, yeah. Be because the bone-in wing people were sitting there going, that's not even a chicken wing. That is essentially just a, a souped-up chicken nugget, and it's just marketing tools to get people to, you know, just eat, to spend more money on essentially just chicken nuggets with sauce on it. And the, ch and the boneless chicken people were sitting there going, well, they're tasty and you get more meat and it, it tastes the same. What, you know, why are you being a chicken wing snob? <laughs> and they're going at it. So, Alex, your point, you are a chicken wing aficionado. What is your take on the boneless versus bone in controversy? I am so glad that this is a controversy in the world and that so many people are debating it. Um, it's definitely a very important issue that we should probably figure out. Um, I see, mm, I always, I think mainly prefer boneless wings. Um, and I think it's a stupid debate that they're not real chicken wings. Um, who cares? Um, they're delicious and they're less messy. Um, and you don't have to deal with all of the bones. 
you know, those things. Um, but I do also enjoy me some some bone in wings from time to time. Um, Scarpaces has the best boneless or bone wings, bone bone wings. <laughs> Bone in wings. Bone in wings. Um, and I, I just sometimes I get a little grossed out by bone in wings with all the little parts, you know? And so sometimes that grosses me out too much. So I usually go through phases with bone in wings to where I'll go like six months without eating any of them. And then I go for like another six months of eating them every week. So, yeah, I go back and forth. But I think, you know, I think the boneless people are... They're right. The other ones are snobs. Who cares? Are boneless wings the future? No. No, no, no. I think bone and wings are always going to be there. I don't think they'd ever, you know, I think they're just going to be as popular. You don't have boneless wing Wednesdays, you know? That doesn't exist. I think at certain places they might. I think the Applebee's was big on the boneless wings. Well, that's Applebee's. <laughs> Yeah. Well, boneless wings are actually, that's where one of the things with the bone in people, they were sitting there going that all boneless wings are is a marketing concoction for when bone, when the chicken wing prices go up because the bone less wings are more processed. So it's cheaper so they can keep prices down and keep like the 25 cent wing night kind of thing going when the, the margins aren't as good and the boneless people went suck it. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Like I said, I do really enjoy boneless wings, and I feel like it's an easy alternative because I can, you know, eat them easier, and I don't have to worry about, like, making a whole big mess of myself, which from time to time I like doing, but usually I don't, and I think that's nice. Well, first off, I've seen you eat chicken wings. You make a gigantic mess. Yeah. Um, secondly, the boneless wings I'm a big fan of because I always feel like I'm getting more value because I'm getting more meat. Right, and you don't have to, like, do as much work. It's like, a, you know, eating eating um, crab, you know? You're like, wow, mm. I could get all of this crab outside of the shell, and that would be really nice, you know? But I could also do it where I have to take apart the whole crab just to get all the meat out of there, and I'm probably not getting all of the meat out of there, you know? It's the, the same thing. <laughs> Crabs are one of those meals that I've always had, like, uh, like you know what, I like the concept. When I see a big thing of crabs, I'm always like, ooh, crabs. But on the other hand, they are always one of those things of, like, this is far too much work for not much of a payoff. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things you realize halfway through, and you're like, oh, my God, can someone just open all these stupid crab legs for me halfway through it, you know? And then you're upset that you just paid $20 for all these crab legs. There you go. So I think we solved it, Alex. So, again, that's why we do this show as a service to mankind. Secondly, speaking of mankind, 20 years ago uh, this past week was a celebration of late 90s music that me, myself, Mike Sasson attended, a.k.a. Woodstock 99. Woo. Now. Now, uh, Woodstock 99 was held in Rome, New York, which is where my buddy Jamie lived, which is why I went, because I didn't want to live with, like, a vagrant in a tent. Uh, so I actually spent the night at his parents' house and had his mom make me breakfast, and then I took a bus and went and saw the concert, and then after everything was done, I went home because I'm an adult. Anyways, um, the thing that get, got me is... Be, being its 20th anniversary, there seems to be an entire industry of people that have to write about stupid shit and nobody really cares, but apparently these people make money. So someone wrote this long article basically saying, and I have the, high, I have the headline just so you know I'm not bullshitting, that Woodstock 20th anniversary was a violent disaster that predic uh, predicted America's future. That's a, that's, that's a, a lot right there in the title. What did they predict yeah, okay. about America's future? I need to know. They essentially predicted Trump, and they predicted the gun violence, and they predicted mass shootings, and they because it was a violent end to this supposed peaceful thing and all this other kind of stuff, and it predicted the 9-11 and the sense of fear and all this other kind of stuff. Because you were there? I think solely because I was there. Okay. That's why it predicted that. But uh, the other part was the fact that everyone 
just saw that it ended terribly. It ended with fires and it ended with all this kind of stuff and the bands themselves like Limp Biscuit and, you know, Metallica and Kid Rock were all of these kind of more rock, more aggressive, testosterone driven bands as opposed to the 60s bands that were all about, you know, peace, love and do drugs and shit. Um, but the thing about Woodstock 99, which I thought it, it really was the point of it, was it was when a corporation decides to put something on, but then not put the money into making sure that people are safe. Right. That's why people were pissed at the end of the day. They were pissed that they showed up. They spent three hundred dollars whatever on tickets and then all of a sudden they couldn't get water right or you know if they wanted something to eat domino's was charging them fifteen dollars for a perm for a pan pizza when in 1999 that was four bucks and i think that's what people were more upset with was the corporization and the fact that these giant corporations were making all of this money off of them and not concerned about their well-being so when it came time towards the end of the show, they pretty much decided to put everything in fire because fuck these people. Did you take part in any of this, Mike? No, I didn't. I just looked at it and was like, they're stupid, and then walked away. Okay, okay. Also, a question unrelated. Are we a testosterone-driven podcast? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think... I think the fact that this show has one of the most prominent female voices of any um, comedy podcast uh, is makes it a lot more uh, female driven. But the fact that some people would say that again, it's a uh, it's named after a man, and you, uh, I would say, are not the typical uh, dainty female voice. You don't so, think I'm dainty? I don't think you're dainty. I would not put you as dainty. Wow, thanks, Mike. I think that's a positive. It is a positive. Um, but back to the, the, you know, the crazy... Do you think that this, do you think this show is testosterone-driven? I would say yes, only because of how our conversations typically steer. I would say it would be more testosterone-driven. But I would sit there and say, do I force you to make these con uh, these these? Uh, uh, do you feel uncomfortable during these conversations? No, I just use my own testosterone to drive myself. So you're saying that it's a testosterone-driven show because I found a, a female co-host who happens to have more testosterone than probably 95% of the dudes out there. Yep. Boom! Win! Victory! But win for me. Back, oh, go ahead. back to Woodstock. Um, I don't understand how like how many music festivals happened before this Woodstock that like people didn't still didn't get the whole water thing, you know? And still until this day, I feel like there's festivals where it's like, hey, we didn't have enough water. Like, why the fuck is that ever a problem? How did we not learn that by now? Because what happens is it's like the Fry Festival and all this kind of stuff. You have this idea, and then you book the acts. And so the acts demand an upfront payment. So uh, with this concert that had Metallica and Dave Matthews and Kid Rock, to get these guys to sign on the dotted line and guarantee to be there, they had to have put – you know, at least I'd say ten million dollars into this. So before they sell ticket one, they're at minus ten million dollars. Right. So then they start getting the tickets and all this other kind of stuff. And someone says, "Okay, um, well, where are they going to sleep?" And you go, "Okay, well, they can sleep over in that field over there." And then someone goes, "Well, where are they going to go to the bathroom?" And you're like, uh, "How much is a porta potty?" And you're just like, uh, "To rent a porta potty for two weeks, uh, to have it there and make sure that." It's maintained uh it costs a thousand dollars a piece and you're like well geez all we can really afford then is a hundred porta potties and so they kind of go okay i hope everyone's nice about the fact that there's one porta potty for 50 people and you know so essentially what happens is is that it's like every other corporation they start making cuts and I think that's what happens is you have these, the, you know, they're trying to find the most economical way to do this as opposed to saying, let's make sure that people are safe. They just essentially find out, hey, how do we do this while making enough money to make it worth our while? 
I think what they should do is for every act that they sign, part of the contract when signing that act um, is that the act has to bring like so many cases of water with them. Like we're gonna pay you $10 million to come and perform at this festival, but you have to bring 50 cases of water to you know help hydrate the people that are watching you. You know? I feel well, like I think musicians the acts would if you sit there and say that we're just we're just we're just paid performers. It should be the responsibility of the promoters to bring the water. But what then I feel like it would the... also be a bad look on all of the acts if you're like, no, I'm not gonna bring water, then be like, okay, you dick, like why won't you bring water to hydrate us? I agree. If I was an act I'd make sure everyone had lots of water. Yeah. Could you imagine, like, I'm a hardcore thrash band, like I'm James Hetfield of Metallica in the middle of my album thing, like, all right, make sure everyone's hydrated, and I just, like, hand out bottled water. Yeah, I think that could be also, like, a good marketing for, you know, the band is get, you know, your own label for the water or, like, create your own special hydration drink, you know? Yeah, I think this is where Gatorade clearly should have, like, introduced, like, a new flavor at this, but he, they didn't. Yeah, yeah, Gatorade would have been great at that. But here's the thing about it. One of the things that I remember about that festival was the idea of a lot of the people that they just wanted to have three days where anything went. Right. Like, I mean, that's I what you think about when you think about when you stage. And there were two people just having sex in a box. Uh huh. And I'm just like, where do you get to a point in your own life to where it's just like, let's in front of 500,000 people potentially have sex in a box? Yeah, because why not? What's going to happen? You know, just a bunch of people seeing, you, you know, your butt in the air, then not, then a butt in the air, then not, then your butt in the air, then not. And then you never see those people again in your life, and uh, you got to say that you had sex in a box at a music festival, and your life Which is complete. Which I bet you at this point in their lives is probably the height of their uh, existence. Hell yeah. Which brings me back to another story. Um, I hope that this is true. I didn't check that it wasn't. But a lot of people are talking about a post on Facebook where a mom got insanely mad at millennials with no kids going to Disneyland. Now, I know you have the eyesight of a 90-year-old woman, Alex, but could you read <laughs> the post? I have my glasses on today, Mike, so I will definitely read it. Um, okay. She said, it pisses me off to no end when I see childless couples without at Disney World. Disney World is a family amusement park, yet these immature millennials throw away their money on useless crap. They have no idea the joy and happiness it is to mothers who buy, mothers who, this is very poorly written, mothers who okay. buy, buys their babies treats and toys. They will never experience the exhaustion that it is to chase a three-year-old around and get stares at assuming I'm a bad mother. Oh, she said this cunt. Um, and some very slutty shorts was buying a Mickey pretzel and Aiden wanted one, but the line was very long. So I said later, and it broke his poor little heart, and he cried. I wanted to take that fucking pretzel from that tramp like, thanks, bitch, you made my son cry. Disney World is for children. People without children need to be banned. Mothers with children should be allowed to skip all the lines. You have no fucking idea what it's like to have to stand in line for three hours with a cranky, tired, exhaust, exhausted toddler. And I can't just tell him that we can't do something because it is his vacation, too. I fucking hate childless women with a burning passion. How are you about to say all this when you have a child? That is not good language to use when you are a mother. Or ever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> Alex, what is your what are your thoughts after reading that? Well, first of all, I don't really like Disney World, and I never really understand why people, like especially people who don't have children, spend their money on that. But that doesn't mean that I think they shouldn't be allowed to do it. I it's, it's just not for me. I wouldn't spend. A, it's a lot of money to go to Disney World, so I wouldn't spend my own money on that. I would have a better vacation um but not saying that other it doesn't make other people happy 
Um, also, I feel like you're just complaining about all of the things. You're like, oh, all of these things about being a mother are great, but then you're also complaining about how terrible it is at the same time and then blaming other people for how terrible it is, even though that y- just because what it, that woman with the pretzel, she could have had a kid and also gotten the pretzel and it would have made your son cry too. That's not her fault. That's your son's fault. That's your fault. That wasn't hers at all. <laughs> Here's my thing. I just feel sometimes that parents believe that every aspect of human existence should revolve around them and their stupid kids. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, you're not better than everyone else because you brought life into this world. That doesn't make any sense. And then brought it to Disney World. Yeah, yeah. Just because we didn't bring life into this world, I, you know, maybe my child would have been a terrible person and you would have hated that person anyways and I would have been doing a bad thing then. But, you know, I decided not to have ch- children so that they wouldn't grow up to be terrible people and now you're blaming me still. See, I just think that a lot of times that, uh, first off, I don't know whether this is real. I hope it is, but it does sound totally real because I do know so many, it's just like, a lot of parents have this idea in their minds that you have no idea. I am doing the most important thing in the world by taking my three-year-old to Disney World. And I'm sitting there going, it's like there's no place ever anymore to where, okay, this is a land for adults it's like any time a, a kid shows up, we're all supposed to kind of just like go bow oh, down. Th- yeah, we're supposed to bow down. And if the kid wants to destroy things, especially at like uh, jobs I've had with like appliances, I, there's been so many times where like there's been certain parents that have their kids under control. They watch something on YouTube, on a phone, and they're fine, and all this kind of stuff. But then there's certain ones that like, oh, you can never tell little Johnny to not run around a store like a complete idiot, where, especially when there's only, you know, a bunch of appliances that are $10,000 a piece. And if they freaking ruin one, you know, what's going on there? And I'm sitting there going, well, wh- when are you going to tell your kid to stop? When are you going to tell your kid to stop doing this? Yeah. And it seems like everyone else has to adjust to the fact that you don't want to tell your kid to maybe settle down. It's not. And then guess what? Maybe you shouldn't bring a three-year-old to Disney World. Maybe wait till they're eight. So they actually remember it. Yeah, so they actually remember it, and maybe they're just not screaming, you know, banshees, especially since most three-year-olds, if you brought them to the supermarket, they would have as much fun as they would at Disney World. Yeah, that's very true, and your eight-year-old probably wouldn't cry about not getting a pretzel. Yeah, maybe go to the pool, or maybe just go to the woods or whatever, and if they want to run around, fine, and then just bring pretzels. They'll be fine. They don't need Disney World pretzels. I think she's just jealous. Every time I hear, like, mothers or fathers, like, ranting like this, it just sounds like, at the end of it, it just sounds like you're jealous that you have, like, that you don't, that you will have kids and someone else doesn't. You know? It just seems like you really want that lifestyle, but you have to just push it in people's faces that you have kids and it's the most wonderful thing in the world, you know? But really, you wish you didn't have children. Agreed. Someone else who honestly you talk about uh, who wants everyone to make sure that they know they have the greatest life in the world. But in reality, I don't know how good this life is, is the J-Lo and Alex Rodriguez. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about how Alex Rodriguez had to actually lose like 10 pounds in like two days in order to fit into a pink suit that J-Lo freaking picked for him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, this Well, this past weekend, Alex Rodriguez is a broadcaster on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, and it happened to be his birthday. So during the broadcast, J-Lo brought in, I think, Alex's kids, and they brought a birthday cake on there. And everyone's just like, yay, you know, isn't that nice that the J-Lo, who's worth like $100 million, brought this birthday cake for her husband, Alex Rodriguez. But then people saw the cake. Show a picture of the cake. Okay, got it. If someone just brought you a a cake that looks like you brought that little effort to it, especially when you're the J-Lo, you're worth $100 million. You could maybe buy some a cake that had my picture on it or at least my name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does say happy birthday. She got the the right occasion, you know. 
she did that but, much. Um, no happy birthday, Alex. Not happy birthday and has a picture of a baseball on it or something like that. It's just like literally that looks like a cake you bought at a convenience store. Maybe that's she's just trying to be funny, but not she didn't do it. Or maybe it's some kind of inside joke between them. Or do you think that I may be just holding the J-Lo to too high of a standard? Maybe. I'm a, you know, she's just a normal gal, you know, just with lots of money. So maybe she, to, maybe I mean, she wants to splurge on different you're the J-Lo. things. You're the J-Lo. You have probably three personal assistants. Their job is to do this kind of stuff. So they probably told you like two weeks ago, hey, the J-Lo, um... It's going to be Alex's birthday this Sunday. He's going to be in, you know, Boston for the Yankee Red Sox game. It'd be neat if you showed up with it. Um, do you want me to buy him a cake? Or do you think the J-Lo would say, hey, why, what are we going to do for Alex's birthday? This is what the personal assistants do. Maybe they Alex is sure just a simple man, and he's like, I don't want anything fancy. I don't want anything like that. I just want a plain old vanilla cake barely any icing i don't even want to say my name i just want something simple you know he's just a simple down-to-earth guy who doesn't like his name on his cake you know that's 100 percent not true you have no idea mike we should ask him we should get him on the show and ask him about his cake and then basically go do you need to know anything else and i would be like no that's it that's all we want to ask and then we get um, him our own cake yeah, then we get a, like a big time cake, like that would say Alex on it, and it's actually for you. But <laughs> see, we do there. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. Yep, I bet yeah. that's how funny J Lo thought her cake would be. Yeah, there you go. Uh, second part of the J Lo. Did you see the new trailer for the movie she did called Hustlers? No. Apparently, she plays a stripper in it, and oh. it's already uh, been uh, explained that there will be no nudity by the J Lo. What the fuck? Is she, like, mildly nude? She's in, like, like basically glittering bathing suits. It's like, right. she's in that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, like, not even, like, point? nude butt. I feel like she showed her nude butt before, so why not again? I feel like that's nice. That would be a nice picture. I mean, wh what is the difference between a nude butt and a butt and a G-string? Not much. I don't think at all. I think it's just the whole, you know point behind it i bet you there's no nude butt no i would at least want some nude butt out of j-lo if i'm spending money to go see a, a j-lo movie with her being a stripper yeah i mean maybe she's really really good at stripping and like being on a pole or something so she doesn't need to take all of her clothes off every stripper it needs to take off their clothes okay well. they could be the most spectacular pole dancers in the history of the world eventually nudity is part of the stripping game Maybe they just said that so that people wouldn't go to see the movie just because J-Lo is a stripper. But do you understand if the J-Lo was nude in this film, it would probably add about $100 million to the take? Yeah, probably. But yet they couldn't get her to at least at least do like the – it doesn't have to be like straight nudity. It could be one of those things where she walks into like the strippers hangout and like she takes off her bra and then she does the quick like everyone sees like side boobage kind of deal. And then she puts on her shirt or something like that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, side boobage. she's in the shower and you see like the silhouette of her butt or something like that. Th that right there is like 25000 25 million in terms of uh, – and box office. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Side boob is everything. I mean, I'm not talking that we're going to see her, like, you know, you know, rolling around naked, <laughs> you know, doing, you know, calisthenics. But, I mean, you got to get some, like, you know, especially when she's playing a stripper. Yeah, I agree, Mike. I think all of this goes back to the reason why the cake, in my opinion, sucked. All right. Last, uh, last story of the night. When I read this. It just came back to the point that uh, some people are just insanely weird and silly, and it's not funny, though, because these people are given some semblance of power. Um, read the headline, Alex. It's a, Cyprus, a bishop from Cyprus explaining why he feels that there are homosexuals. Um, it says, Bishop, Bishop is condemned for telling his congregation that gay people exist because pregnant women have anal sex. Let's let that sink in a bit. This is a bishop. 
This is a human being that has been given a position of power in a very prominent church. Here is his theory of why there are gay people. He says that while the person is in the womb, if the mother has anal sex and enjoys it, that enjoyment transfers to the baby, and then ultimately then when that baby grows up, they have that longing, and that's why they seek out the anal sex. Interesting. Interesting. But there are straight men that like butt stuff, too. I mean, I think people just need to have reasons for everything. And this guy uh, got his reasoning that way. Would you admit it's an insanely stupid and moronic reason? Well, yeah, definitely. It sounds like a you know a twelve-year-old boy uh, came up with it, and is now a bishop. I would be insulted if a twelve-year-old boy came up with this. <laughs> I would if I if I met a twelve-year-old boy who sat there and went, you know, there's gay people because mommy's having. I'd be like, shut up. You're the stupidest boy in the world. You need to go into that porta potty and get thrown off a cliff. Oh, right, That's exactly. But it does sound like something that would happen when you like don't really know how things work quite yet, and you have to explain things, you know. Or it's like a you know a kind of terrible person who's trying to explain gay people to uh, their kids, and trying to go a roundabout way of explaining gay people, and then they just come up with this. But here's my thing about anybody that's involved in religion has the go-to answer, the easiest answer when anybody asks why something happens. God's will. Right, exactly. Like, I always thought it would be weird to go to, like, a predominantly, like, very religious school. Because if you take a science class and says, how do plants get their food? God gives it to them. Yeah. You know, who who uh, who won the war of, uh, of 1812? Uh, uh, whoever God wanted to. Like, that's all you have to answer. Like, you've got that go-to answer. Just say, why are they gay people? Because uh, God uh, wants them. They're just, you know, God controls everything. That's what he does. Yeah. Why did you have to make up this weird thing about moms enjoying anal sex? I think he's just really into it. I think he secretly wants to get some MILF porn where they get, like, some butt stuff. Probably, yeah. He's like, I will watch all of the pregnant women having anal sex, and, you know, I will watch it all so that I can figure out what should be banned just so I can help there not be more gay people. I think Here's what, what I would sit there and say. I bet you, if you wanted a scientific thing, Mr. Uh, Cretian P Bishop, find all the MILF pregnancy porn videos find these women most of them live in north hollywood california and uh then find out about their male babies and chart whether they eventually start to uh long for uh butt stuff yeah i bet i absolutely believe that someone will give you funding to do that research study yes a very prominent university will give a grant to you to figure that out yes they will there you go. Because always the big thing about this show is financial dealings that make big time cash. Yes. Alex, that's a show. Yeah, it is. Alex, thank you very much. Again, we will be back next week with more wondrous things. And uh, again, thank you to everybody at the River's Edge. Keep listening to the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com. Keep listening to Grown Dad Business with Aaron Kleiber. And keep supporting all of the shows on the River's Edge. Thank you uh, for Mr. Um, Vincent Didiato. He's always been a supportive of the Mike Sasson Show. Thank you to everyone out there. Keep hope alive enjoy the rest of your summer get out there and start drinking on the lake start drinking on the river go to your nearest ocean start getting shit-faced and think of the mike sasson show and smile again my name is mike sasson that's alex clemens we'll see you next week bye